We're very interested in how the police and the courts work, not just the family courts, but also the criminal courts. And so we've been lucky enough to be able to interview Liam Allen and his partner, Hannah Arkwright, both of whom have experienced false allegations. Um, Liam's case uh, went on for a, a well over a year while the police investigated the allegations of rape and sexual assault against him. He ended up in court and it was only on the third day of his hearing that it was revealed that the case had absolutely no substance whatsoever and it collapsed. As a result of their experiences, Liam and Hannah have set up a charity called The Defendant uh, to support people who find themselves either just coping with uh, a court appearance um, or indeed facing false allegations and having to have support to cope with that experience on top of simply the criminal process. Liam, when um, you were first arrested, what, when was that? January 31st, 2016. So right at the beginning of 2016. You, yep. I gather from what I've heard online already, is that you, you came home as normal. You were living with your mum at the time. It was a normal day. And then suddenly there's a knock at the door and the police are there and they've come to arrest you. That's, that's right, isn't it? What, what yep. happened? What did you feel like? Uh, I was just, it was, I, uh, this is probably one of my favourite weird sort of thoughts uh, in terms of the story. So I was just started my criminology degree at the time. And so when they'd knocked and they, you kind of realised that they were the police and what really was kind of going on, I honestly thought uh, that the only realistic possibility was that my course had arranged some sort of like <laughs> life experience. Oops. <laughs> of like what it's like to be arrested and um that wow. this was all just going to come and what i need to do is pay attention because there's going to be a test or something or i was going to have to do some sort of coursework on it or so you know and it, everybody laughs at it now but even now saying it it still feels more realistic than saying i was accused yeah. of sexual assault so i was I mean, I was really ready to just go to the police station find out what was going on because at the time i still didn't really know what like the, the ins and outs. I knew that I was being taken to the station. How I many people turned talk. up? There was only two. Right. Um, one was really friendly. The other one was really not not aggressive, but really confrontational. Right. Um, quite standoffish with my mum, quite standoffish with me, immediately thought I was going to try and run. You know, it was like, I don't know, just seemed on edge. I don't, I'm not really sure why. Um, because nothing was really happening to make him on edge. It was like, oh, can I get dressed before we go down to the station because I'm in my dressing gown? And immediately he was just like on his, you know, toes and like, oh, he's going to jump out the back window. And I was sort of like, Oof. I don't right. think I can fit flat windows. So, Two men, was it? Yeah. Good cop, bad cop. Okay. I think so... I just found it a bit, I don't know, humorous at times, like the way that his partner was acting he sort of seemed to giggle a little bit at things that his partner right. was doing okay um, so you get you get taken to the police station you've pre presumably never been in a in a custody suite in a police station before um did you get a lawyer what yeah you I, offered I, I, a lawyer I, I really wasn't aware of like what the whole process on this was even at the time so they said that they get in a solicitor in for me and I thought oh it's going to be somebody I know you know like I just thought maybe I've got somebody that I in my you know back pocket that I didn't even realize so I've just got a buddy coming down and then some bloke turned up that I've never met before um you know and he sort of went here's what you've been accused of they're gonna ask you some questions and uh, then you'll go home and that'll probably be it and so yeah just went outright of, of answer the questions with all the information that you know and like you can think of and you should be fine I, like i think he asked at one point you know like what's basically happened or is there any truth to it um just because i think that probably gauges what advice he would give um but yeah uh, just it was just like just answer honestly and that was about it we just cracked on right it seems that n not that serious though because i mean it, you're not getting told that it was a very serious crime that they've arrested you for and that you might you know one of the outcomes could be going to prison what did anyone talk to you like that 
No, not really. I mean, like, when I got in the police car from my mum's to the police station, um, that was when I got told that it was an accusation of rape and sexual assault. And they told me who by. And, you know, like, I mean, my mouth just dropped. I, I was in tears in the car because I, I don't even think it was like, I never really thought I was going to go to prison because I, you know, when, I guess when you're innocent, you are just literally like, what ridiculousness is this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you also are aware of how serious it is because I guess the first thing is if you're arrested, then your belief is that they must believe it, you know, kind of thing. And I think that's what sticks with you. Um, and so, yeah, when I was just in the car and then they had like this really casual chat with me. And I think, you know, everybody talks about full senses of security and how they try and like ease you. And so they were talking to me about my degree and what I wanted to do in my future. The person that took my fingerprints and everything like that, he, you know, he and I had a great chat in a weird way. I mean, I was crying at the time whilst having this chat with him. But I think for me, it was, I was so focused on just, I don't know, like, carry like just speaking to people you know just kind of trying to process it but also not just completely sitting there silently because i think i'd have driven myself mad so you're kind of inclined to normalize it really there's you keep trying to bring yeah, it back to just, normal somehow yeah just to like you know i guess maybe part of you thinks that well if they speak to you and they get to know you then they'll understand why you think this is so stupid you know like um I'd, you know, I'd, it's not even I'd never been in trouble with the police. I'd just never been in a fight. I just, I just yeah. wasn't a violent person. There's no temperament. There's nothing there. So, you know, you know that people that know you know that, but these are complete strangers. So they're basing it off of what's been said, and what's been said is the opposite. So, um, but it's it sounded from what I've heard you say to others because I've listened to other times you've been talking, and you're also saying it here really that nobody is giving you the impression that this is going to go very far. Is that right? Yeah, I was told it wasn't going anywhere by police officers, by um, the solicitor, the chief solicitor, my solicitors afterwards. Just everybody really didn't think there was... I mean, there wasn't... I mean, it's not even everybody thought. I mean, everybody knew there was nothing to the case. There was no evidence. There was no nothing. It was word against word at one stage, what we thought. Yeah. And then these text messages just came out and really just sort of went, although, yes, if we cross-examined things would have come to light because there were contradictions left, right and centre. But the, the text messages just showed the right timeline of events, what had actually happened. And that was really where the strengths of it lied. But everybody, I mean, the police officer in charge before I was charged said that he put on his recommendation, he doesn't think I should be charged, which I found out is a lie. But oh, because he didn't say he that said on the phone two hours before I was actually charged. So, um, so do you yeah. think this was a ploy then, rather than nobody actually thought this was going anywhere? Uh, I think if you're told, and uh, this is more from knowledge now, if you're told that the aim or the target is to increase convictions, you want to do everything possible to prevent people going to absolutely hammer your case. You know, like you don't want somebody proactively doing things that's going to harm the case if you've been told by your seniors get them you know like convict them at all costs <laughs> it doesn't you know at this stage it doesn't matter as if we hit 10 percent, then we'll look great so just get rid of them and then all the pressure comes off of us kind of thing in an obviously more formal more trainee sort of voice but if that's just the ultimate message that's coming through what you know you're you're always going to tell people don't worry i'm on your side i'm doing what you're you, you know you, we don't want you to do because that's the only way you can stop somebody else from doing it, I guess. Okay. So did they take the poli the um, your phone from you that day? Did they take yeah, your phone? That. Yeah. They had my phone for a year and three months. Okay. To, uh, to then tell me that they couldn't get anything off of it. And they I... knew this, I think, about a month into them having it. Okay. That it, you were charged even longer after that, weren't you? You got your phone back before you were charged. Is that right? No, I got my phone back after I was charged. Um, so right, got, okay. I was charged after I was charged officially. I think first of March. I was told on the phone like maybe five days before, so it wouldn't have been that long. Maybe even four. 
Okay. But officially in the station was the 1st of March. And then I got my phone back in like May, I think it was. Um, and and yeah, when, they just said, when was the last time you, what's the time between the complainant, when you last saw the complainant and the time that you're arrested? Is there a long time or is it a few days or weeks? I think it's five months. I think that's okay. the top of my head. I think it's five or six months um, of like no contact, nothing. So, and is um, it? And when did she make that the complaint in relation in that period of time? Is it that they took a long time to arrest you, or that it was five months and then they arrested you straight after talking to her? My understanding is there was like a five day, six day gap. Okay. Between right. her complaint, so I think it would have been at the end of January still. Right. So they've got the phone. There's, there's, am I right in saying there might have been some texts on your phone, about 100? Were you, was that right or, or not? No, no, nothing so at all on, right, okay. I had a new phone um, at the time. I think I'd got a new phone maybe three months prior. Okay. Um, and so everything was pretty much fresh. It was, I mean, so the, anything before that was on my old phone, which I'd sold, so... And deleted presumably everything on it before you sold it. So you reset. Yeah, yeah. you have to reset yeah. it. Otherwise yes. It, yeah. Okay. So so this disaster carries on with you actually being charged, and a hearing. And yeah. what at what stage do you, does it really come into your mind? I could go to prison. Uh, it was after. So the one big time was actually in July. Yeah, July. And um, that was July 2016. And what had happened was I was told we'd be given a decision whether or not I was going to be charged or um, it was going to be no further actions. Nobody really spoke about being rebailed. Um, and so that was when I was supposed to go in. I went to the police station and what had happened was the officer in charge didn't turn up, but nobody he didn't tell anyone that he wasn't coming. So we with a solicitor that I'd never met, stood outside for, I think, nearly three hours. It was about two and a half, nearly three hours. Um, with the police station going, we're really trying to get hold of him. I'm sure he'll be here soon. He wouldn't be something like this. Only for them then to go, right, go home and we'll contact you. And then never hear anything until March. I mean, like I was the one calling them to get some sort of response, which is probably my downfall in the end. Um, probably because... What? Because you're not. Yeah, I think I just annoyed them because I was. Just, it must be quite irritating, I guess. You know, when I don't think it's that not, was your downfall. No, 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 no. But as in, like, <laughs> why? A, why a decision was made by the CPS? Because supposedly a decision was made without any evidence being looked at. And so, what seemingly happened was the officer in charge, when I called for like the hundredth time on that day had then tried to push through, like, we need a decision, we need a decision to the CPS. It had gone backwards and forwards so many times. There's every possibility whoever was looking over the case went, right, just charge him and we'll roll the dice. You know, if he's innocent, then the jury will find him innocent. And if he's not, then we'll, you know, we'll catch him. God. And I don't think then it was based on likelihood of conviction. I don't, I think it was just too coincidental that two hours after I've called the officer in charge to chase it up again, that that decision came back so immediately when everybody was saying it shouldn't have done. And even now people look at it, you know, and say, I still don't understand, even without the evidence, how it got there. Um, so something must have happened behind the scenes, but it's impossible to know. Nobody's I was going to say, you're, ne happened, you're yeah. never going to know, are you? No. But at some point you realise that this could lead to a, a prison sentence. Yeah, you know, when, he, when he first didn't turn up, my solicitor had said, I think you're going to be charged, given how long they're taking, and you're probably going to be held in remand because of the type of right. offence it is, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it, he was giving all this advice, and it ended up being not so helpful. But, you know, I think at the time, he seemed to generate panic. Like, he seemed quite panicked, which then in turn means if you're panicked and you face this on a daily basis, I really need to start, you know, <laughs> mentally, you know, like, I need to join you. Ah. Um, and so that was, I think at that point, that was when it really settled in that mm. I was like, okay. And I kind of just prepared myself that at some point, if he's convinced, if it's not now, at some point in the future, it looks as if I'll be held in remand or something like that will happen. Um, because the counts were just rising. It was three when I started and 13 when I finished. So like, I was 
charged with 13 different offences at one step. Well, all, all yeah, against the same person, though. All yeah, against yeah. the same person, yeah. It was three when she first made her accusations, and then there were 13 examples that had suddenly been plucked out of the air. Um, well, so 12, you... and then in the trial it got upped to 13. As the first day of my trial, that was the first thing that was said, was, oh, we found another one. So you go to court thinking, presumably, that... Well, what are you thinking? I won't, I won't try and guess. First, it was really weird because first day of trial, we were made to wait, as most people are, I think, at this stage, because another trial from the week before I'd run over. And I remember I drove my family absolutely insane because outside the courtroom, there's like a little section, probably, oh, you can't see, maybe like, oh, no, where's my van? <laughs> like this big. Um, and I mean, I literally paced up and down it for maybe three or four hours while we waited and then they sent us off for lunch because I got there at like eight I think with my family and I just kept walking along it was one of those square sort of carpet things you know where there's like checks in it and then um, I was walking along the lines of that in the uh, like rectangle and just continued to do that for like three hours straight because I was just my everybody was asking me you know what, what are you thinking what's going on blah 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 and it was just I was driving myself insane because mm. Well, it's, it's horrible, just, isn't it? It's just, I mean, I, so my lectures beforehand were on uh, accusations of rape and how the police were now being trained. And um, I'd read a, st I'd been given a statistic as part of my course that said in trial, 50% of people that go to trial are found guilty. It is literally a 50-50 um, at that stage. And that was two weeks before I was supposed to go to trial. They showed a video of a mock trial of somebody and like there was all this ambiguity around whether or not it was true and, and you know, it was word against yeah. word and you had yeah. to listen to people in the class going, well, must have done it. Why would somebody lie? And you think that's how people are going to think in the jury. That's that's yeah. where you, that, I mean, that's part of what we started to think as a, like, me and my family before we went through this was it's harder to comprehend that somebody would lie now about this than it is to think that somebody would do this like it's harder to understand so it started it started as a he said she said trial on day one is that right that was it really basically the evidence was what you said and what she said so what on the first day my barrister had come in and came with their folder and pulled out a string of text messages and said look this these have suddenly been added into the disclosure pack as of, I think, a week ago, maybe a week right. and a half before the trial. Um, everybody was confused. They were all a bit of uproar. My solicitors were in uproar because we'd been asking for six months over and over again, and we continually asked for the whole time, what messages have you got? What text me? Why would you keep the phone for so long? Blah, blah, blah. Um, and these were text messages taken from her phone, which was something that nobody... There was no record of them downloading stuff from her phone. So it led into my barrister go uh, inquiring a little bit more about what, where these had come from, you know, what else they had. And even in these messages, one of the lines, I think that's been used all in the media was, it wasn't against my will or anything. And this was the first conversation she was having with a friend about it. And it was where things started to snowball. So it did start as a little white lie for, I don't know what reasons. I mean, seemingly it seems attention based because of what the conversation was on, which I can't obviously go into detail about. No. But then it started as like a whole, you know, I, Liam wasn't like X, Y, and Z. He was a bit more like blah, blah, blah. Um, and then it just snowballed into, once you started with that, her friend sort of then went, that's not okay, that's this, that's that, and started putting things like labels and stigma mm. onto it. Mm. to which point she tried to back out in that conversation and because her friend was so headstrong in it about what she kind of read into it as what things were um then she then went wild with it. it was at that stage where you know one small thing then became this whole story that just seemingly was being built up from all sorts of things i mean there were jokes that her friends were making but like to her privately that were then used as accusations later on and so you could see where once you okay. saw the messages you saw where the story was coming from yeah. but until you saw that nobody could un really understand how that was happening 
Um, so did yeah. more text come out beyond day one? Because it, my understanding is on day three, your barrister decides to um, go through them and spent nearly the whole night going through some text. Is that six, 60,000 pieces yeah, of... Yeah, so we... Yeah. We got... On the first day, there was no jury, there was no nothing, and we asked about um, the text messages. I think it was kind of half dismissed because there was no jury, there was no nothing, you know, so I think they just wanted to sign the day off and go move it on to the next day. Um, but what they did do was go through like the really minor admin bits in the very beginning. And then day two, I think they wanted to swear in the jury and they did that. And then before the jury came in fully, um, the before the trial began, my barrister asked, where did these text messages come from? Over and over again, until eventually we got an answer of, oh, well, the police downloaded a disc, uh, downloaded a disc's worth um, from her phone. And there were 2,418 pages worth of messages with 30 messages on each page. So it's about 60,000, but it was her whole phone that was downloaded. So it wasn't right. just sort of stuff, which is where the police officer then tried to block us from seeing it, basically, and just said, there's nothing on there. Uh, I've been through it. Somebody else has been through it. People have signed off on it. You don't need to see it. And there was just this constant... It's just girly chat. It's just per it's too personal. You can't see these things. It, you know, it's not, you, you don't have the right to view them kind of thing, basically. And then when eventually, it was actually the prosecution counsel, Jerry, who then said, well, I don't see, it's not for the police to decide what's relevant and what's not. And so if a lawyer hasn't done it, then, you know, have at it. I haven't seen these before. I didn't know this existed. So here you go. And then Julia went through them. I went through them in the night and Julia and I regrouped on the third day because we asked for more time mm. uh, to go through everything because it caused us so many messages, you know. Yeah, it is absolutely. And we were told that we were given 24 hours and we had to get them in the right format for the jury. And so we thought there was going to be like maybe five or ten conversations. And I think together we pulled out a hundred conversations between us and these weren't just like one off messages. It was like strings of conversations that disproved everything. It, you know, they weren't just like, oh, maybe you could infer this. It was just like, there's no way this could have happened if this is what's being said during that specific time. And these are the messages all around that time. How does, you know, there's no way that could have happened. And so even the prosecution then went, oh gosh. Um, and then on the Thursday, on the like on the fourth day once we kind of asked the judge look like these messages are a bit there's no way to get these in the right format in time for a trial the prosecution agreed then you know uh, i think they some of the examples were read out and the judge and the prosecution both were like muttering under their breath oh my gosh you know what on earth what's going on um and there was this whole just reaction of how did this not come up sooner and the judge sent the prosecution away, asked them to write a letter apologising to the judge for wasting his time and um, said, you need to decide whether or not you really think you're going to go ahead with this, basically. And so they were given two weeks. From what I'm, I know, they wrote a letter straight off to the CPS to say, let's drop this. This doesn't need to go further. Um, it should never have got this far, basically. And then they did a handwritten well, typed out an apology to the judge and, and gave it to the judge two weeks later. It sounds, okay. as though, it sounds as though you were kind of lucky with the prosecution The prosecution barrister, barrister was really good, I thought, from because what if, I heard of the, him. If you didn't have that intervention, do you think you'd have got hold of the texts? No, I think it's a lot harder to have faced that. You know, I mean, they could have said anything. The, pro the thing is with Jerry, who was the prosecution counsel, he came onto the case the day before like he was given the case on sunday because the other uh, the prosecution mm. barrister had a trial that ran over mm. and so it was pure luck because apparently that prosecution barrister had also signed off to say i shouldn't see those oh, and goodness. had also goodness. gone through those which raised red flags then that's you know basically where we sort of were at so if we didn't have jerry if we didn't have the judge i mean the judge could have easily just gone no get on with the trial and the worst bit would have been was that would never have been counted as new evidence because technically we had it. And if we couldn't get it 
together in time, then that's our problem. So I we're just wonder, I, I wonder, Liam, if any of those people, any of the police officers, the original prosecutor actually read all of that or just assumed there was nothing there? Somebody had to read it because they pulled out messages that they thought they were going to be able to use to prosecute me with. Right. Really? Somebody had to go through it. Right. That's where 100 messages came from in in the beginning. That that was prosecution evidence. It wasn't just like a random, ah. um, oh, here's 100 messages that we found, by the way. It was, oh, by the way, this is evidence that we're going to use. And that was why there was an inquiry as to where where did that come from. You know, so they, you have, they had to have known there was other stuff there that might might be against their case, as it were, for, you know, that you should really have. Yeah, they they in the review that they did afterwards, it said that the officer in charge, you know, promises that he went through those messages, but he just can't recall how he recorded all the information. And so either, in my opinion, they must have cherry picked. It doesn't make sense not to. No. Cherry picked if you, you can't, manage. not with that amount of information, you can't cherry pick. Yeah, exactly. You've got you to find it. Find what you were hoping to use as your own evidence you must then, have read other stuff mm. must have read other stuff or <laughs> yeah. you were intentionally ignoring the other bits you know if yeah. if they'd have told me that that existed i could have told them to go through that i could have given there were text messages between myself and her that it was just my name that had been deleted so i wasn't a contact but my number was there I could have told, I mean, we searched it through using Control F. Like, it wasn't like a technology, we didn't hire a guru or anything like that. We didn't do anything jazzy. We got a PDF document and held down Control F and typed in 20 search terms. If we'd have had that for the two years, we could have pulled all sorts out of it. I mean, the case would have been blown to absolute pieces. It was just that we had 24 hours. So we did everything that we could that still blew it to pieces, but I'm so sure there's more in that absolutely sure there's going to be more in that evidence but i just there's no need to go through it again you know and i wonder why you know if if at the beginning there was a sense that they were telling you they didn't think this was going to get anywhere so did the people at the beginning actually have a sense of this not being a sensible case to proceed with you know i i, I just I suppose the question is, at what guessing. level is this decision being made? Yeah. You know, is it the people on the front line or is it somebody else well, it's the CPS, deciding but... that they should just get a conviction? Mm. I think yeah. it's the differentiation between a personal decision and a professional decision. In your personal decision, in their personal opinion, it shouldn't have gone ahead. They, they wouldn't have wanted to pursue it. But professionally speaking, they've been told to pursue everything, convict, find guilt, blah, 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 whatever and increased conviction rates. That's what they're targeted to do. So professionally speaking, I guess the, the big cultural question is how are police officers performance reviewed? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I guarantee it's not on how many people they find innocent. No, of course not. Of course not. No. no. It's no. just as simple as that. And then if that's the case, everybody who wants any form of career progression will just push people through. That's it. You'll cut so, corners, your evidence will do whatever. It doesn't matter. So if you saw somebody in the similar circumstances today, happening to you today, happening to them today, what would you say to them? What would you Gather say about that a... first trip to the police station? The first, to be honest, the first trip is always, I, I hate the, I mean, solicitors advise no comment and they're in the best legal position to advise those types of things. But personally, I just think it's better to just get yeah, it, it like there's no reason really why you shouldn't be able to answer the questions that are in front of you. Um, if but, you're innocent. but yeah, if you're innocent. Um, <laughs> nice intervention uh, there, Hannah. <laughs> um, but really, I mean, it's answer the question that's in front of you, you know, and it's about having confidence in the truth. Mm. But as soon as you know what is going on. Or even you've got like a little inclination, start doing your own groundwork of building up or storing evidence that you've got yourself yeah. and make copies of everything. Because yeah. what you don't want to do is be like, oh, I handed this over. And then the police go, I don't have any record of you giving us over the evidence that yeah. you're in. We, we don't know where that's gone, you know. And Great people, advice. People laugh and they say like, oh, well, that doesn't happen. The police aren't going to do that. But 
there was no record of this phone download anywhere. Like it just didn't exist. It was hidden. Mm. Um, so. And I yeah. think from what you've said, another, another suggestion I would have, which is don't take when, when people say there's nothing to worry about, worry, you, you know, you cannot, you cannot accept just kind of advice like that in a situation where you know what, well, you didn't, but I mean, with rape, you are most likely to go to prison if you're found guilty. Um, you should be on the alert straight away, not just not just accepting that people say this is going nowhere. Because if it's actually going nowhere, why did they even arrest you? Why did they waste all that time getting you in the police station if nobody thought it was going to go anywhere? You know, it doesn't it doesn't seem right to me. Um, yeah, there's, there's, that advice is. Very, I mean, I think when people say not to worry, I think it's more don't, you know, generate unnecessary panic or like inside yourself. I think it's very, a lot of the anxiety is caused by wanting to do something and not being able to do anything. And you seem, I think a lot of people, I mean, we speak to a lot of people, you know, going through it currently and every single one of them, whether it's a family member or the actual person accused or whatever, all will say, well, what should I be doing? Should I be doing this? Should I be doing that? And what they're actually, what they should be doing is just living their normal life at this stage because a lot of them are like, right, we've got all the evidence, we've got it stored in a box, you know, it's ready to be used. But you don't really use your evidence until trial, I think is what the experience has become. Or unless you pay for a really, really good solicitor from day one, who will then use it on your behalf and do something with it probably. But just handing it over to the police doesn't, doesn't no. work. No, it doesn't. No, that's true. But you could say that no comment is doing something as well. I mean, it's like a position. You take a position. It may, it may make you look guilty, I suppose, but at least you know it's not. It's not. It's not that you're not doing anything. If you if you want to, you know, you. It may feel better to kind of normalise the situation by answering the questions, but I could see there's another argument which says, why help them make at all? Make them work for it. Make you know have a deliberate plan to not do anything until mm. you have to. Yeah, exactly. It's, I, the, the thing is, is like I think that's just a where i'm probably not a legal professional like you know it, it there there is a oh, sense I of i think you're i'm not not criticizing i mean i've you know done exactly the same yeah, thing i think that's the thing which is it's probably naivety you know where you're like oh just tell them everything it's fine yeah. and what yeah. actually happens is they'll pick one sentence out of context and go that's what yeah. we're going to focus on yeah. and even when it's been disproven they'll be like but you said this at that time and then it'll get to trial and then everybody will just sort of be like well this is a yeah. waste of everyone's time. Why did you do this? Yeah. Did you yeah. give a DNA sample? No, it was, I mean, it was such a long, like it was over a, a two year time span. And then I was accused five months later doing any DNA sample to them made absolutely no sense. I think they no. might've taken like a swab in my mouth and that was pretty much like, it wasn't like a, an invasive one. No, no, that's what I mean though. Yeah. yeah they, they, they did do the, that. Yeah. It was just the swab, but it, I, you know, other people go through all sorts of, other tests you know yeah, uh, that yeah. are a bit more invasive so yeah yeah, um, yeah. it was kind of like well i just i do want to say you know you, do, you just want to tip her around it don't you? you don't want to say it bluntly but no um yeah it was just a very i think so i can't even honestly i can't can't fully remember okay well a cautionary <laughs> tale a cautionary tale liam for, for people to take heed of i think Hannah, yeah. you, you and you and Liam are working together now because you've created the defendant. But you've you've had a similar, not well, you haven't been charged with rape. I didn't mean that, but you you've had a similar experience um, of having a false accusation. Is that right? Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, as you said, not similar to uh, no. <laughs> Liam's, and you know, it didn't go to trial, so uh, I was much luckier in a lot of ways. Um, than he was <laughs> but you both you both having a similar um a similar experience means that you you obviously have experiences that have meant, meant that you've created the defendant this organization yeah so what we found when we were going through it was that, that there was a huge lack of support um i was quite lucky in the fact that my police officer at the end one was very empathetic towards me um, and was actually quite supportive. Um, and so that was good, but most people don't have that. 
and you know solicitors are hard to get hold of at the best of times you know they'll contact you when they have anything but yeah. you know i rang mine hundreds of times and received you know absolutely <laughs> nothing back um so yeah so our experience was lack of support and you've got family and you've got friends but you know my mum's common line was oh you, you haven't done anything you have nothing to worry about which is not that helpful because as you as you said you have to worry and if i'm going to spend you know 10 years in prison how can i not worry about that um so yeah, it's quite. good to have something kind of impartial um where they don't have an opinion about kind of your case which is why we set up the defendant so basically um we set up a charity that provides practical and emotional support to defendants, defence witnesses and defendants family members. Um, so we have a helpline that runs on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays. Um, and we have an email support team for people that need kind of, or would like longer term support and check-ins. And um, so we have a number of volunteers that will, that will check up on people, particularly if they've got trials coming up and that kind of thing. Um, and then people bring our helpline for more immediate support or questions. Like we don't give any legal advice, we're not legal professionals, and neither are any of our volunteers. But um, we can give practical advice about like what release under investigation means and how long they might be on bail for, and like, those kind of things. So we would never suggest to someone um, that one option is better than another in terms of like actively doing something. Um, so in terms of like evidence, we would never say, you know, what to do with this evidence, who to give it to. Uh, it would always be contact a solicitor. Um, the kind of furthest we would go in terms of legal advice um, is contact a solicitor or lay out the options for what they can do. Like you can appeal a sentence, you can appeal your conviction, those kind of things. And what do you find is happening with people's experience with the police? Are they are they having reasonably? I mean, are most people having a, a kind of reasonably positive experience? Are they being dealt with fairly? Or are they having something a bit like what you've come across, Liam? Things get worse. Yeah, I think most people have a very negative experience. But I, I don't know if that potentially is because what you've been accused of really clouds the whole thing. So everything feels very negative because you're maintaining your innocence and you've been accused of something and this person is the one that is gathering that evidence. So whether it is actually unfair and the police force you know, are all going downhill or whether it's just because you are so um, kind of dumbfounded and upset by the allegations that it appears that they're not acting fairly. And presumably you're going to hear more from people who are having a bad experience than people who are having a good experience. So inevitably that's going to happen. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> people don't need, you know, as much support if everything's going swimmingly. And... I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if that's necessarily true i mean we have horror stories but we have had quite a fair amount of callers that the police are doing things by the book the problem is is just it takes time to investigate yeah but if they've generally been quick and done by the book you know people aren't gonna but i mean yeah, I, well I, I think some people still have that are like you know it's over it was nfa'd but that's true you know, I don't know how to move on with life. I don't know how to, to do this. I don't know how to, how do you cope each day? You know, there's a lot of people on the groups that their case has ended, but I guess the trauma yeah, is still okay. there. There's a lot of things outside of the police as well, you know, like social media and, and what media stories are out there. We've had a few cases where media stories were reported at the time of like arrests. And then since things have been dropped, the news articles up there that, presumes guilt yeah but you yeah. know for, so when somebody googles your name it's one of the first things that comes up and there's and, no correction yeah yeah exactly that's it and the police did their job but do you complain to the police about the media then can the police do anything do you so so are you he hearing from people who i mean what sort of crimes have they committed is it the whole range of crime or is it predominantly some types of offences that attract the need for real support? Um, most of the people that call us are maintaining their innocence, but right. have been accused of a whole range of things. Um, largely at the moment it is sexual offences though. But I think that's but, just, ne like our, you know, I guess it's our bubble really, hmm. where, where we're just yeah. starting out. Hannah and I's network starts in sexual offence cases 
and miscarriage of justice world and not necessarily in the outside boundaries of that which is where the charity is looking to go but that's just part of growing so at the moment it's a lot of the similar people i spoke to somebody quite recently who's been held in remand over murder um which is a really odd case um but again you know protesting innocence all, all sorts of things there's not that many that we've come into contact that have said well actually you know, there's been a few handful admitted yet yeah and and child sexual abuse have you got those kind of cases well the thing is largely we don't ask about the offense right itself or about right. guilt um because it, it it's unimportant to the support we provide so um if people choose to tell us they choose to tell us and usually when they tell us it's about sexual assault um mainly i think because they think they might be speaking to liam <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> Yeah, so I, I don't think anybody has said. No, something. I was mentioning that particularly, though, because we're hearing from people who were involved in the family court that one of the things that is one of the things that are, people are falsely accused of in divorce and separation cases is the abuse of children. Yeah. Um, you know, so so there we believe there are a lot of those kind of accusations going about. I don't know how much the police get involved in those, but it would be interesting to see if you're hearing a lot about that as well, just because we are hearing so much about or, it. Or too. domestic abuse without a sexual element yeah, to it. Yeah, yeah. That seems to be a fashionable thing to allege, whether yeah. true or not. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people, yeah, to be fair, that do mention that it's arisen from you know, custody course. issues, yeah, or yeah. something, or, or fallouts, or... Well, children's contact, children's yeah. custody, yeah. children's yeah. residence, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, well, that that doesn't surprise us. <laughs> it's a different ball game, though. I think that's the thing at the moment because we're criminal law. Not all of them necessarily become criminal law because it's no, that's wrapped true. In the case, so, yeah. um, I think for us, it's all about broadening that expertise, and which you know, I think having now spoken about it probably in more depth is probably something that's on our agenda anyway, but something to really mm. look at. It's also, you know, we get people from Scotland calling and Scottish law isn't our forte, but we try and do what we can. Um, and Northern Ireland, I think that's a mess. Yeah. Um, so so is, is it doing well? Is your new, is your new business doing well? Your new charity? It was depend how, how you would define that i think there's an obvious need for it um and it's being well used by the people um that we kind of in in our miscarriage of bu justice bubble and uh, sexual assault, sexual offenses um but it is hasn't yet um kind of evolved into the all-encompassing um charity that we would like it to be um you know we would like Every, it to be available and known to people accused of anything, um, which at the moment it's not. But we're working on it. I think yeah, it's just it takes you know, just that it takes time. It's done really it's well. Early days, the, isn't it? Really? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's done yeah. really well for the expectations that we had. Good. In the early days, you know, we were expecting to just sort of have no contact, and at the moment we've got a fairly large volunteer team um, that have things to do you know there's always volunteer opportunities at the moment in terms of helping it grow but also everybody has had contact with at least maybe three people mm. i'd say no, I, I don't know no but like <laughs> as in just if we're going for like ballparks sure. i'd probably say everyone that is working with contacting people has spoken to at least three or more some people yeah. have spoken to a fair amount more but mm. um again, well, I, it's just it's I, probably I, in the right place. Yes, yeah. I have no doubt it's, it, it's much needed. Uh, I, I can't imagine what people do um, in the circumstances that they find themselves in if they can't afford lawyers or the lawyers aren't very available even though they've got one um, because you really want to hear advice now, don't you? Or at least get some support now rather than in a fortnight's time when you might get to an appointment or get to speak to somebody. So, And family and friends can't really do it because they're... Oh, well, family certainly is part of the problem. They're as upset as... Well, they may not be as upset as you are, but they're certainly upset for you. 
Yeah. And so yeah. The, getting yeah. getting some kind of reassurance or support is yeah. very hard. You lean on your close family, who are already under pressure. So. So it's called the defendant. What what? There's a website. Is that right? Yeah, the defendant.org.uk. Right. Good. It's easy. Um, That's fine. Helpline and there's an email support team if people don't necessarily want to call over the phone or, um, yeah, or don't just prefer generally email. Some people prefer doing an initial email and then call the helpline. Excellent. Um, Excellent. Yeah. Well, good luck. I I hope it works well and maybe in a while you'll come and tell us how it's get how you're getting on with it and how much bigger <laughs> it's grown. That would be good to hear. <laughs> we will definitely. Okay. Thank you for talking to us. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. <laughs>